I think one of the most powerful sections of Scripture there are. We get to, well, if we get to verse 6, uh, we'll get to uh, the, what we call the Christ hymn. Um, but we've been working in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1. Okay, it's taken us a few weeks to get through chapter 1, but uh, we uh, finished it up last week. A couple things uh, just by way of review. One, we talked about uh, having an eternal perspective and what uh, uh, difference that makes when we're dealing with suffering and persecution. Uh, Tony, again, in his, prayer, or his uh, sermon this morning, talking about uh, suffering and hard times and difficulties. One of the phrases I didn't use as much last week that I'd put in the notes as I reviewed that and looked at it, uh, it was interesting, one commentator talked about seeing persecutions as seals of adoption, like that it's this great privilege. Oh, your privilege, uh, uh, it's a seal of adoption that you get to suffer uh, for the kingdom. I'm not sure that's always the perspective uh, we have, um, but uh, I think that that's uh, exactly what Paul's getting at as he's talking about living in the first century. The other thing that we talked about uh, that uh, having eternal perspective does is it allows us not to be controlled by fear. That's the battle. And I remember last week, I'm not talking about that initial gut reaction, oh my gosh, I'm in this. No, it's that sense of uh, fear that sort of paralyzes you, that overcomes you, that says, uh, is God uh, enough to get me through this? It's that kind of fear that really is sin. We don't want to use that language, but scriptures are pretty clear that that's a, a lack of trust uh, in, in God and what God's doing. So I think that's uh, really key. The second thing we uh, looked at last week was how lives of trust in the Lord in the midst of suffering and persecution are signs of two things. One, it's assigned to opponents of their destruction. Uh, you may be look, looking at us and you may be laughing at the circumstances we're in that we're imprisoned or that we're suffering or that people are being beheaded. Uh, and you may laugh at that, but here's what you need to understand. There is a God who is faithful, a God we trust in, and there's nothing that you can do uh, to make me deny him. Uh, and so the witness to those who don't believe of faith and trust in the midst of a persecution is powerful. The other uh, thing that we looked at last week is the encouragement to other believers. And I think that one's uh, the one I worry most about. I worry most that <clears throat> while we think of illness, and I know that can be uh, tough. I've been there when my wife was going through cancer. I know it's tough, but we don't know much about persecution. We know about illness. We know about loneliness. We may know about divorce. We may know about those kind of things. And I think it's important for uh, our children, our grandchildren, to see our witness, our friends, to see our witness in the midst of those. But I wonder if outright persecution, what if we start being jailed? You know, Tony makes a reference about me being jailed today. I don't know where that came from. Uh, maybe he knows something uh, that I don't. Um, so uh, that's uh, one, of, one of the things is that if that stuff starts happening, uh, how are we going to react? I always like to think, well, yeah, I think I wouldn't deny Christ, but I don't think we'll ever know until we're there. But when you're living through it, when you see people show you the way, uh, you know, I joke a lot about, about hunting, but, you know, there's my uh, grandson, a uh, couple years, been able to show him how to do it. He's, had, he's 11 years old, shot two deer. I didn't get to shoot my first deer until I was 12. Uh, and there's a lot of people that hunt a lot longer than that, never get to do it. But he's, he saw it, he's seen it done. He's, uh, so now it starts to become, I wonder about that with persecution. Uh, how do you go through that? How do you not deny when you're beaten, beaten, when you're uh, put in jail, when people are dying? How do you not deny your faith? I read books, you know, uh, Brother Yun uh, in China. I can read about people doing that, but I haven't seen that too much. So uh, that's one says that we can be an encouragement uh, to others as they go through it. I think that's important. Then the last thing last week, Paul encouraged the Philippians to see both their faith in Christ and the privilege of suffering uh, for his sake as gifts of grace. Love that. I mean, I'm not sure we even get the first part. You know, why do you have faith in Christ? Well, I was smart enough to believe at some point. Well, really? <laughs> uh, was it really that you were that smart uh, and that you got it? Or is it that maybe, just maybe, there was a God who uh, some refer to as the hound from heaven that before the foundations of the world uh, decided uh, that you were to be one of his and sought you out and found you and put people in your life and created circumstances uh, and continued to pursue you until all of a sudden you realize there's an incredibly great God that loves me and wants a relationship with me. 
Uh, and so we talked about that, uh, that uh, to see their faith as a gift from God. And then the second thing, to see suffering as a gift from God. We don't like pain. I mean, we've grown all our lives spent trying to avoid pain. I don't care if that's physical, emotional, whatever form it takes, you avoid it. It's always bad, right? No. Uh, I love when Oswald Chambers talks about us being amateur providences. And we see someone that we love hurting or suffering, and the first thing we want to do is, boom, we want to rush right in there and we want to stop the suffering. Because we're just not going to allow people to suffer that we care about, right? Well, there's a good, hand, a good chance that when we do that, we are intervening in the very circumstances that God's using to bring uh, someone to themselves. Um, so to starting to see that, that every, every situation is an opportunity that God can use uh, to bring people to himself, I think it's very important and to see that as a gift of grace. So that's where we left off. Going to pick up in uh, chapter 2. Let me pray and we'll dig in. Lord, thanks for your word. Uh, thanks for having a body of believers that we can share stories. Uh, you know, I, I look around and I know uh, I see some people I care an awful lot about who have lost loved ones, uh, who have lost children, uh, who have battled cancer, uh, who have uh, been through circumstances that I, I can't imagine. And for me, that is an encouragement. And I pray that as we continue to read about what life was like in the first century uh, for those who first heard the gospel, that we might be encouraged, that we might be prepared, that we might be better able to be the men and women of God you want us to be in this world at this time in the midst of what we face. Uh, we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, someone want to read for us? We're going to focus on verses 1 to 5, maybe get to verse 6. Someone want to read verses 1 to 5 for us in chapter 2 of Philippians. Okay, great stuff. That, that first verse is sort of interesting. This is a, sort of an if statement. What is it describing? So he says, if this is the case, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort of love, any participation in spirit, any affection and sympathy, what's that a description of? He says, if there are any of these things, what's he describing? What are they a part of? Those things are all supposed to be part of something. He says, if you've had these experiences. But they're a part of unity. He wants these people to be Of what unity? Of Any the unity? Church. Oh, of the church, of believers. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. I think he's, he's describing these almost as characteristics. Uh, uh, what's, it, what's it like to be a believer? What's it like to be part of the body of believers? And, and he says, well, there's encouragement, there's comfort, there's participation in the spirit, and there's affection of sympathy. It sounds a little bit like uh, most of the intros that I give at our time of intercessory prayer, because I think that's literally what it is, is that uh, how is it that you become part of it? How is it that you're part of the body? And he's saying, if these are in place, I always uh, refer to the 12th step of AA that starts out by saying, uh, having had a spiritual awakening, uh, and then it goes on to, you know, say, taking our message to other alcoholics and addicts who still suffer. But if you haven't had the first part, if you haven't had a spiritual awakening, you don't have anything to, to take to other people. I think that's what he's saying. If you've never experienced the body of Christ, then you're not going to be able to do what I'm going to talk about from here. But these are the things that God intended us uh, to experience. So let's break them down a little bit. Help me hear what that experience has been. What, what's your encouragement in Christ? What that, what's that been like for you as part of the body? In what way were you ever encouraged in Christ? No one's ever been encouraged. Man, you're discouraged people. Ever been encouraged? Ever been in a point where the body of Christ came around you and, and you experienced that? You know, um, I was going through cancer and recovery, and the 
God in Prayer just made me feel so like that it was probably the first time I felt the love of God that hmm. was around me. Yeah. Yeah, and if you haven't experienced it, we take it for granted. You may uh, assume, but I remember Muff being asked, when was the first time you knew that God loved you? Uh, it was a Sunday school teacher to ask her. Her mother had died uh, when she was five uh, and of cancer. And I don't know what happened, to her, but she had not experienced that. She didn't have the experience you did. And, she, and, and I remember her saying, I said to the teacher, I didn't know God loved me. He took my mother. You know what I mean? So to have been through cancer and to have people come around you, that's, that's powerful. Hopefully your kids got uh, to see it. Others. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's powerful, Pam, because sometimes when we say when you're encouraged, you know, we, we base so much on feelings that encouragement, and I love that, looking back, wow, these people, I, I, I didn't give up. It meant I got out of bed, uh, there was enough reason, enough people that cared. I was able uh, uh, to get out of bed the, the next morning, and I don't know if I would have. So, yeah, it's not always just this feeling emotion. So, But you get the idea is that especially... When you see people come around you that if they weren't, they would have no other reason. It's not like they were my best friend. It's not like uh, they were family. Some of those people, they're sort of obligation maybe uh, uh, to do some of those things. But what happens when someone cares for me, uh, not for that reason, but encouragement in Christ, it says, just because of their relationship with Christ, just because we're part of the body, these folks encourage me. So that's one thing. Any comfort. And those two, I'm going to put those together. There may be a little bit of difference uh, there, but it's the same kind of idea. Any, uh, any comfort any comfort from love. Um, hmm. Is comfort from love, is that always that it made me feel good? If someone comforted me in love, does that make me feel good? I, I'm going to talk about a time I was, <laughs> I was loved. I, I don't know if this is a good application. I think of my high school football coach, who I think really cared about me, but he also paddled me my senior year in high school because <laughs> I wouldn't quit talking in his class. I know that's hard to believe uh, uh, that, that, that I would, but that was for me, that it, as weird as that sounds, that was comforting, like that he cared enough to say, no, Mike, you're out of line. And I think of you too much to allow, this is someday your mouth's going to get you in trouble. It's got me in a lot of trouble. Um, and and he was willing to care. So I don't think that's necessarily the heart of what Paul had in mind when he was there. But, but there is a comfort comes in a lot of different forms. That's the only point I want to make about this is that too often we make love an emotion and it's sort of the romantic thing on TV. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think someone, you know, taking a stand, the book of Proverbs says when we don't discipline our children, we hate them. And I'm not sure a lot of people would necessarily think of that as comfort and love. But, but for me, helping to, uh, people to experience those boundaries, helping uh, uh, to experience that, hey, I'm committed to you, even though you've wronged me, even if, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. And I think it's, it's got to be more than just, oh, you've made me feel good uh, because you love me. I, I think comfort can take a lot of forms. Any other thought there on that comfort and love that, I just wanted to broaden that a little bit more than just made me feel good. Deb? It's also like a heroin addict uh, giving their heroin. Oh, yeah. That's what they want most. Yeah, and uh, why I didn't uh, go there, I love that uh, as an analogy. I say all the time, it's almost you almost have to completely retrain yourself to think, how do I love someone when if I would do it in a traditional uh, way, I would actually be de- probably helping them destroy themselves. So i got to love... I brought comfort. Uh, that may mean I took a hard stand against something they, they were doing. I really like that, sort of the tough love kind of thing. So those are two. Third, participation in the Spirit. Uh, describe to me what participation in the Spirit is like. I mean, we talk about it all the time. This is one, we throw the language around the church all the time. But somebody tell me, what's it like to participate in the Spirit? Boy, science is worth a thousand words. How, how, 
How are we going to share with the world? How are we going to be witnesses to the world of, of, uh, of participation in the Spirit? Mm-hmm. And it was messy and it was not easy, but it was spirit, I mean, spirit led, right? Right. And, and anytime I think you find yourself with other believers trusting God and stepping out in faith to do something, it isn't necessarily what would make the most sense. Oh, yeah. Is, is, a, is, a, is a kind of, like this is hitting in the spirit here. It's like, you know, this isn't necessarily in the world's eyes a great idea. I know this is, me- but God has kind of put it on our hearts and leading us. Steering us to, to do this, well, let's let's do it. You know? Right. Let's let's make this decision. And I think, yeah. you know, uh, the people that you're closest to, you you tend to pray and ask God to lead you in ways that aren't just circumstantially circumstantial, but kind of by the Spirit. Yeah, that may not seem that radical, but uh, I'm looking to use the term, you know, make sense in the eyes of the world or common sense. Um, that a lot of times to live by faith. Uh, in many ways, is to do it counter to, okay, what is the logical, common sense thing to do? It doesn't mean you throw that away, but, but to be spirit-led means I gave up the right to determine for myself what the best way forward in whatever circumstance, maybe that's starting, starting a business, maybe that's uh, starting a prayer group, maybe that's whether or not God would call us to do a homeless ministry, whatever it is, is that... Uh, for me, that was one of the hardest things because I'm a planner. I, I get up first thing in the morning, I make my list, bam, 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 and I just start working, just start plowing through that. That makes sense to me. You set goals, you work your tail off, and you accomplish them. And then you become a Christian. And God says, uh, I don't want you going in that direction. You know, so you think of Acts 16, you think of Paul saying, oh, well, I'm going to go to Mysia. Well, no, I don't want you to go, oh, then let's go to Bithynia, you know. So, again, as Ken says, you, you have some folks, you're, you're trying to figure out how to go forward with whatever it is that, that you're thinking about doing. And the, the way that we've been trained and the way that the world does that is you think what makes the most sense to you, what's going to give you the most pleasure in the long run, and then you set the steps and you work your tail off to do it. When you become a Christian, frankly, you give up that right. That, that's what it means. For Jesus to be Lord means he reigns. It means he calls the shots. It means he gets to determine where we go, what steps we take to get there, when we get there. Like, that's unsettling. And that's frustrating to someone who likes to be in control. And so I, I think there's a lot of that participation in the Spirit. What does it mean to be, make decisions based according to the leading of the Spirit? Uh, Hannah Whitehall Smith. Old mystic, 1800s, uh, wrote about uh, knowing the will of God. And I love what she said. She said, you know, there's four characteristics. One, you search the scriptures to see what they say. You talk to more mature people that you believe that are in the, the scriptures and walk the faith before you to see what they're going to have. Uh, you look at the circumstances that God creates in your life uh, and you try and understand how he might be leading you there. And then you listen to the impression of the Spirit in you. And she says, anytime you see all four of those coming together, there's a good chance that God might be leading you. I like that, but I, I don't know how many uh, uh, secular uh, psychology class would tell you this is how you make a good decision uh, in doing it. Some of that's common sense. Some of that is, most of it is, well, you think about, you make a list of the pros and cons, right? And then you list, and then you do whatever the, the, the pros are. So you see there's different, because lots of times you would list the pros and cons, and you say, well, this is what we should do. But the Holy Spirit's saying, I want you to go here. I want you, I want you to, you know, I'll give you a couple for instance. We're, we started the outreach. Uh, the agreement was I would get, turn in my monthly bills, whatever we got, uh, uh, whatever monies were there. If there was money to cover my bills, I would get paid. Well, that didn't happen a bunch of months uh, in the first year when we started, but I also was really feeling convicted, you know, we're not tithing. So I go to a board of directors and say, uh, here's the deal. I think we've got a problem with the outreach. We are not tithing 
monies that are coming in. And they're saying, do you understand, you're not getting paid some months. I said, that doesn't matter, really, does it? I mean, if something's out of whack here, why would God give us the monies if we're not doing it the way that he wants? Do you feel the tension? Like, the common sense is, you don't, you don't start giving away 10% of what you have coming in if you don't have enough coming in to pay your bills. That doesn't make sense. It's just that we've hardly ever missed paying a bill since. Because something needed corrected, God was guiding, and so we did that. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And, and, if, and if you don't know that, then you're still calling too many of the own shots in your life. And if you haven't had to rely upon other people, the other thing I love about this is it's in the context of the body. If you don't need other people praying for you, you're probably not trying to do uh, enough of what, what God might be asking you to do. That's what Henry Blackaby gets uh, at when he's talking about God-sized tasks. If, if, we're only, if we're only willing to try what we know we can accomplish, what's the faith in that? And so I love Blackaby's section on that is that, yeah, most of the time if you're feeling, oh, that's too big, that's too much, that's impossible, there's no way I can do my own, there's a good chance that God might be in the midst of that calling you to be part of what's going on. It doesn't mean you're foolish. It just means that, yeah, he's constantly going to try and put a situation where we need to rely on the Spirit and we need to rely on this encouragement from, from other people. So I think that's cool. And then, uh, uh, then he goes, if those are the case, if those things uh, are the case, then there's something in verse 2 that he wants to, to have. He wants you... He says, I want you to complete my joy. Pretty selfish, isn't it? What, what, what do you think he means by complete my joy? Does that mean uh, make me happy? I think in some sense it does. Don't be afraid of saying that as a Christian you're happy. Uh, C.S. Lewis makes a, a, a big uh, deal about that. As Christians have gotten the wrong idea that if anything does feel good, uh, you know, it must be wrong. Uh, so anyway, uh, so I don't think that's what you get. So... But what else? It's more than just that, isn't it? What, what's it mean? How would you describe complete my joy? Yeah, he truly wanted it and he was willing to suffer for it. I mean, he's in jail. Because he's going around establishing churches like this. So, you know, when he says complete my, my joy, it's like, yeah, there's, remember, we talk about joy and hope of something transcending the circumstances of life that we live for. And that's what he's saying. He's, if he was just living for the circumstances of life, he wouldn't be finding joy in the fact that he's being persecuted and hearing that many of them are. But, but when he hears that they are experiencing the kind of things that he's experienced, all those things that we just listed there, any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in spirit, any affection and sympathy. When you've experienced, if you're experiencing those things, even though I know you're going through hard trials, even though I know that you're being persecuted, then, man, what he says, that, that, that gives me this great completeness of, of joy because I've been willing to put my life on the line because I believe so strongly in the gospel message. And when I see you having those same kind of experiences, even though you're living for Christ, you've got your mind set on the things of heaven, even though you're going through all these things, there's that, you talk about encouraging other believers, there's Paul being encouraged and, and uh, built up by the people he's been trying to lead. Those who are fallen, when, if you've had people follow you, if there's younger people that you've led to the Lord, when you see them making decisions and uh, you know, being willing to be missionary, willing to try and start a business because they really thought God was uh, call, uh, calling them to. When you see them uh, trying to live life differently, there's nothing that, that fires you up more. And, and I think that's what he's saying is that, man, it just reaffirms that my life, all that I've been through was worth it because I see the way that God's empowering you uh, as, as you're uh, going through this. So he says that, complete my joy, and then there's something else. There's something that he longs to, he says, there's something else here that would add great joy to me in the midst of what I'm going through. Uh, not only seeing those first things that we talked about, what are the other things that he lists there? When he says, complete my joy by being of the same mind. We're different people, right? Uh, if you want to see that in action, just come and watch Muff and I for about a half hour, okay? 
we see everything different. If you're supposed to set the table, I probably start at the head of the table and she starts at the side. If we're cooking a meal, she starts with the vegetables, I start with me. It doesn't matter what it is, we go at it completely differently. So, does that mean that we're not of the same mind? No, because you all have the same goal. Okay, you have the same goal, yeah. Like, and, and, and here in particular, I think he is talking about mind, and, and I want to think of those, that text in Romans 12. In Romans 12, it says, no longer be conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I think that's what he's getting at, uh, is that he says, I'll see great comfort when I see you guys being of the same mind. What does that look like? What does it look like for people who may normally see things differently to have the same mind. Yeah. If you've never had that process, I feel sorry for. I think that's one of the most wonderful processes there are. I, I love session meetings for, for that reason. Put a bunch of different personalities in a room. But those personalities truly want to, to glorify God. And so, you know, I love when there's folks that are not willing to get caught up sort of in group think, oh my gosh, I better not say anything because I'm seeing this differently. No, I love when people are sharing, oh, I see this thing differently. But in the course of sharing that they see things differently, there is that, there's this deep inside passion of we want what God wants here. And I'm seeing it this way and you're seeing it that way but somehow God's going to lead us to his end. That is an incredible process. And I think that's what he's getting at. You know, there's a lot about unity here. And so he's talking about the same mind and the same love uh, uh, and being of full accord in, in one mind. And I think that second time he's getting more towards will. But so one is to think, have our minds set on. Uh, and that's, that's really, uh, my grandson, I've been joking about him hunt, hunting, he does not have the same mind about me hunting, okay? So for the hour and a half before he shot his deer, what do you think he was doing? Had my iPad there. He's playing all sorts of games, okay? For an hour and a half before the deer comes, what am I doing? Every ounce of my being is searching every piece of woods, every nook and cranny. I'm looking for the least uh, movement of, of something. My mind is focused on one thing. He's like, just tell me when I can shoot. You know what I mean? He, he, uh, he is not, uh, we are not of the same mind yet, okay, uh, when it comes to honey. He likes the shooting, but, but you see the difference there? Uh, and so, yeah, there's a unity. He likes the idea of getting a deer, and so that's sort of the unity, but the, the minds are not thinking the same. How about having the same love? What is that all about? Is that just emotion? Mm -hmm. So we all have the same goal, we all have the same purpose in mind, and that is to serve the Lord and to serve God in the right way. So what does that bring to together? Mm -hmm. And that's also the exact same gift, but we all bring it in different ways. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Pam. And I'm trying to, there's some reason why he split these. Like, he could have just said, have the same mind among you, uh, and gone on. But there's some reason that he first said have the same mind and then have the same love and then being a, a full accord and I think he's really getting at the will. How, how is, ha, have, and maybe it's just three ways of saying the same thing. They're very close. I'm, I'm splitting hairs here a little bit. But if, there, if we are splitting hairs, what's the difference between having the same mind and having the same love? It's respect. Respect. Okay, uh, so yeah, maybe the per personal interactions as we search to have this unity of mind coming at it differently uh, as we're trying to serve. Yeah, so maybe there's that respect. Can't it look like something you were thinking. Like on a personal level, I think our faith, you know, we kind of learn, like our mind begins to be changed, mm -hmm. renewed, you know, by Christ. But I don't think until that becomes kind of a heart uh, consideration, it, it doesn't necessarily kind of play itself out in the same way. Our will isn't necessarily shaped entirely. So I think it's kind of like, I can think in a similar way to somebody, but mm -hmm. when I'm, when that kind of is transferred to my heart, that, that 
bridge gap, whatever this yeah. you talk about, you know, it's kind of like, it's all together different because then it does, it becomes my, more of my will. It affects, it affects me. It's like the affection comes, you know, kind of after the, appre- you know, kind of apprehending what you ought to do. And then it's kind of like I have an affection to do it. And then you're all together. And it's, it's like everything comes together. Yeah. And, and, and I think you're right. There are definitely differences where you, in your head. You may say, oh, this is what I want to do. It's like, Maybe someone is going bungee jump. I'm just using an analogy if I'm up here. Okay, in my head, it's, I think this is a good idea. Now I'm standing and I'm looking down, and there's a little bit of difference between in my head uh, wanting to jump and my heart of like, oh, yeah, I really want to do this. No, I think this was a bad idea. Let's go. Uh, try to, to get a, a, a difference there. And I think there is a, a difference as far as is your heart really into it. Uh, some, some people would often use that language. Some of this is just how people are wired. People learn this way. You know, we always, uh, some people are visual learners. Some people are hearing learners. Some people are kinetic learners that they have to touch. In some ways, I think Paul's trying to get at that. He's trying to say there's different ways people uh, uh, go about being committed to the body. Some people, as soon as they can visualize it in their head, as soon as in their minds, oh, this is the right thing to do, now I can do it. Some people... You'll hear them use like, oh, I'm not there yet. Like, in my heart, I'm not set on, uh, you know, I'm ready to, to be all in uh, to this kind of thing. So, so I think he's saying, yeah, I think you need to, whatever the difference is, whatever you need to, to not only have your head into it, but have your heart into it, that will make my, because I, I know that you're invested. Um, and he's going to complicate, because I want to go one more level, because, and, and the thing here that I'm going to do is a little bit of a, I'm cheating a little bit, because the heart I know is a lot more than emotions. But I always make, there's a big difference for a lot of people between making a decision of will versus making a decision in their head or making a decision that they feel is right. So that's a third nuance here. Uh, help me understand that distinction. What, what's it like to be, a, when he says one accord, to me that's more... Having, having the will uh, uh, of a body of people committed to doing the, uh, whatever it is the Lord's calling you to do. Help me understand that distinction a little bit between feeling like this is something we should do, thinking something we should do, and making a decision of the will. Okay, you might not want to do it. That's where I think it comes up, where it becomes important. Just because there's tough circumstances... And your head, remember we talk about common sense, may evaluate and say, mm, this doesn't look necessarily like the smartest thing to do. So we see Jesus in Gethsemane doing that, right? Lord, if there's any way, please take this, will, take this cup from me, right? Is what he does next, is that a decision of the mind? Is it a decision of the heart? Is it a decision of the will when he says, Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Yeah, I, I think it, yeah, and, and that's where I think will gets. Will, will, will encompasses. Will, will is what makes a decision. I always use the analogy from Apollo 13. Here's Tom Hanks. You know, he's out there uh, flying around. He's ready to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Only problem, we got a damaged heat shield. My head is saying, if I enter into this, I know the heat that's going to be generated, generated, this thing could burn up, you know, I could be, you know, toast in, uh, in just a second here uh, if I enter in. I also know if I stay out here orbiting, uh, the odds of them getting somebody to me and being able to recapture me is not very good. So intellectually, uh, I have assessed all this. My heart says, I got family back home, you know, and I want to, I want to get back with that. I want to see my kids and my grandkids in the worst way. But how do I go from, oh, I could burn up if I make the decision to go through this, uh, but that longing to be with my family, then he makes a decision, right? I'm going for it. Once he starts, once he re-enters, it's not like you say, oh, I get, that's a little warmer than I thought. I'm going back out. <laughs> that option's not available, Okay. And so you watch, uh, you know, the neat thing is it's a three-minute deal, you know, as NASA is watching a three-minute blackout, and they have no idea for three minutes whether that guy burn up or not. 
And, and that's what I'm getting at is that <clears throat> a lot of times we're going to, we talk about participation in the Spirit. God's leading you to do something. In your head, you're looking at the options, you're thinking about doing this, and you're saying, well, I want to do it, <laughs> but there's sure some drawbacks here. Your heart is saying, yeah, but man, remember when I told the Lord I would do anything he called me to, you're like gung-ho. And so those two are going at it. At some point, there's got to be a decision of the will. I always use the language I know. You know, it's, there's no way I'm turning back. I'm going for it. That's that decision of will that there's no turning back. And I think he's saying, if complete my joy when you're of the same mind, same love, full accord in one mind. If, if I can get a group of people who are committed to that, I'm in business. I, I remember when I started coaching, our program was terrible. We didn't win the football game until the first thir 13th game I ever coached. 0-8 and 1, first year. Horrible, okay? But, you know, we're, we're grinding towards getting better, right? When we're in the midst of it, you know when I, before we ever won a game, you know when I, when I knew I had them? We lost a football game, and I got called into the principal's office as an adult. I mean, I was used to it as a high school. But <laughs> as an adult, I got called in because a couple people complained. Some of the players threw their helmets after we lost the game. And I know it's hard on the equipment. I know that those things, uh, those are a discipline issue, and I need to talk through it. Why did I say oh, I knew that I was on the right track when guys threw their helmets after we lost the game? They cared. Man, we lost a lot of games. Oh, I'm just going out with my girlfriend tonight. You know what I mean? Like, when it started, they, they could have cared less. But all of a sudden, when we lost the game, and they were irate, they were upset. I was like, yes, here we go. Uh, it's going to happen, you know what I mean? Because now, we're ready to go for it. That's what he's saying. He's saying, make, make my, complete my joy by being the same way, being so sold out to what God's called you to, that come hell or high water, there is nothing going to stop us. We are going to be the people of God that he wants us to be. You know how much fun it is to be part of a group of people like that? That's what the body of Christ is supposed to be like. Is that we're supposed to encourage help, because some of us are going to be slower in our minds to do it. Some of us are going to, our hearts don't, and some of us, just when it comes to making that decision, it's really tough. But when we rely together and we hear the call of God and we're willing, there is nothing that's going to stop us from being the people and doing what God wants us to do, that's when it's fun. And that's what, that's what he's describing there in, in verse 2. Any other thoughts there in one or two? I know I'm moving fast. You're not used to that. but Daily dying to self. Oh, yeah. Daily. Why is that important, Linda? Because we can slide back into our natural way of thinking. And just a little decision, start to lose that vision, and then we just pull each other back in. And, you know, it's very easy make more comfortable decisions but they just kind of you know so anyway I, like even just mottos like I mean the unshared motto or the glory goes to God or just recommissioning yourself to God and it's just the um, lessons to help me face you know to wake up every morning and say why am I alive you know um, that I would glorify God and enjoy him forever yeah and just kind of keep committed to those those truths helps me keep my eye on the yeah, and I love when you say, you know, keep committed. Because it's not like you do this one time. Yeah, you make the one, one decision as soon as you start in and the heat starts to hit or things start to go wrong. That's when, you know, you're like, whoa, let's put on the brakes and let's get out of here. But you're right. It's that keeping committed. It's being reminded. Um, you know, that's what I love about sharing life with month Because we see things different, very seldom are both of us down at the same time. Um, I'm actually down a lot more. I'm a lot more emotional, so I'm like this. You know? She's Miss Steady. I mean, she just uh, uh, is steady. So, yeah, when you're part of a group of people committed to a vision and, and you're going for it, don't think that you only got to make that decision and stay committed, you know, once. I mean, it's constantly needing uh, to, to recommit, refocus and have people bring you along. So I think that's good. How about, uh, and Linda brought this up, why then, as he calls him to that kind of, I think that's the vision that he lays forward. In verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others uh, more significant than yourself. What about the first part of that? Uh, why is doing nothing from selfish ambition 
How does that enter into this vision of, of unity that he's laid out? Yeah, one, there may be nothing that will split that apart, will uh, harm the vision, will stop the process of going forward than selfish ambition. Why? It causes, yeah, divert, it, it causes dissension, it causes argument, it causes uh, uh, people pulling at odds. I always uh, use the analogy, one day I had the brilliant idea, I had this huge pine tree when I first bought my house 31 years ago. This huge tree I wanted to pull out, so I got two four-wheel drive trucks, put chains on that tree, and I'm like, we're going to pull this baby right out, right? We're laying on it, spinning the tires on uh, Allegheny Street. Tree won't budge. What do you think the solution to that was? One more truck. Uh, one more truck? <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, it was one less truck. I got rid of one truck. Why? Yeah, pulling against each other. Exactly. So that's the idea. As soon as uh, we got this selfish ambition, all of a sudden when people start saying, oh, no, we should be going this direction. Oh, no, I think we ought to be going this direction. Oh, no, I think we have, yeah, you start, add another truck, you know, drive it, put it in my living room and hook up the chain and pull that way. I mean, yeah, you start pulling different directions and you're battling against each other. And, and so I love that imagery. So there's nothing that undercuts unity more than uh, selfish ambition. So he says, one, you know, do nothing. Notice that. I mean, that's the hardest part. When Jesus, uh, Matt, go ahead. Mm. And it's because it's in that we have to be humble enough to accept that we may not always be on the best of reasons. Just like you described in the book, but as a group, you know, yeah. we're just coming much farther than we could go in and of yourself, even though we could get to where we wanted to go in this meeting, which is past the gospel. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I, and the sad part is how much in our culture, because remember the lie of Satan in, in Genesis 3 was when you eat that fruit, you will not die but you'll be like God. It's a, it was a total encouragement to do the exact opposite of what Matt just described. It's live for yourself. Everyone else is a threat to you. Everyone else is a threat to you getting noticed. Everyone is a threat to you getting a pat on the back. Everyone else is a threat to you. Well, go ahead and live that way. Try and be the body of Christ and, uh, that way, and you're not going to get very far. You don't believe me? Go look around you. You know how many churches are experiencing that? How many churches are dead, falling apart? It doesn't take too much conflict uh, to destroy a church. And, and he's saying nothing from selfish ambition. And Matt went to the second part. So the first part is sort of the don't. Uh, uh, or the first part is uh, don't do this. Don't focus on selfish ambition and trying to make a name for yourself. Instead, and you know I know it's all sports analogy, but I love the Steelers right now versus a few years ago uh, when you guys named Brown and Bell uh, were playing with the Steelers and saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And it destroyed a whole locker room and destroyed a whole team towards a bunch of guys. Everyone, the newscasters can't stand it that Juju Smith isn't complaining or Smith Schuster about not getting enough receptions. Like what's it, as long as the team wins, what's that? Like that shorts athletes out. You're not supposed to be so concerned about how the team's doing. You're supposed to be worried about number one. Paul's Paul's saying, no, do nothing out of selfish ambition, but as Matt said, in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Why the term humility? Matt, you use that too. Why does that become so important? Well, because it's, it's putting, thinking about yourself less. It's, 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 it's not thinking about yourself less. It's thinking less about yourself. Okay, it's thinking less about yourself, and that in some ways is hard to do, Matt. Yeah, right. Right. I think it's when we decide that we know better than everyone else and we can be fixable if God saves us and listens to us. But the reality is it takes many minds and many thoughts and bringing us back to Scripture to be able to move forward in a way. It takes humility to recognize that you don't know the answer to anything. <laughs> and that you can't, by fixing everyone else in the world, finally get the world right. It really comes down to it's just being who you are. 
Yeah. <laughs> Remember the old song, and it goes against the way I am to put my human nature down? That, that song had it right. I, Linda mentioned a, a, a minute ago about camp. And, you know, again, I was a young Christian, but we, my biggest struggle in 1982 was my first summer at camp as a counselor. And I got asked to speak quite often, which was pretty unusual, uh, first year as a counselor. The thing that was my hardest thing is when they asked somebody else. I got ticked off every time they asked somebody else. I didn't want them asking somebody else to speak. I wanted to speak, you know what I mean? So here it is. It's that, so then you're saying things like God first, others second. You know, I, I really like the God first part, but that other second thing, it really ticked me off. Uh, you know what I mean? And it does. You ha it, it takes an intentional decision. Like, We've been trained in that. Our human nature, fallen human nature is all about self. And we live in a culture that's all about that. And so making that decision to humble yourself, making that decision to say, maybe I don't know it all. Hey, maybe it's better for God's kingdom if I never speak at all. I mean, who knows what is. You know, Muff's great. Here's my uh, wife's wisdom. She knew I had been here for, I've been part of this church for 20, how many, Tony's been here for you? 27 years before Tony ever shows up. God calls Tony to be the pastor of this church. What do you think my wife's biggest concern was? Mike, you need to know your place. <laughs> okay. And, you know, and she says, I'm going to give you something to remind you. I said, okay. She said, Mike, become small. She said a bunch of times. How many times? Mike, you need to be small. What was she saying? Yeah, you need to keep your big mouth shut. You need to do what Matt was talking about. You, there's something bigger and more important here. One, there's a church that God's established. Two, there's a pastor that he's called uh, to be pastor of this church. And you don't like being second. <laughs> so you need to become small, okay? You get the picture. Yeah, this is not stuff that left to ourselves we just do and we need people who care enough at times when we're not doing the the process you know whether it's a deacon meeting whether it's a session meeting whether it's a, a small group whether it's a family trying to make decisions he's saying yeah my I, i'm going to be full of joy when i see you guys do this because it's not an easy thing to do not an easy thing to humble yourself and to consider others more significant than yourself i love what c.s lewis in mere christianity I don't know uh, if you've ever uh, read this. Maybe it wasn't even in mere Christianity. Maybe it's in his yearly devotional, The Four Loves, I think. At any rate, he makes a distinction what love has come to mean today versus what he think it used to mean. He says, love used to mean wanting the best for other people. What do you, how do you think he defined what love has come to mean today? Any ideas? Anyone remember that? Whatever makes you feel good. Not whatever makes you feel good, but he actually was trying to talk about it in a good sense. He says, we've come to mean it's denying ourselves. So when we were even just talking about humbling ourselves, there's a big difference between humbling ourselves or denying ourselves and wanting the best for other people. Do you see the difference there? In some ways, it's still a focus on self. Oh, to love someone means, oh, I've got to deny myself. Yes, but... Even a step further is to want the best for someone else, to love them. So it says, count others more significant than yourself. Heck, that's almost as bad as making yourself small. Uh, I mean, uh, you, see, you see what I'm getting at? It's that this, this idea of, he's saying there is great joy to be found in, in pouring yourself into helping others experience themselves as significant. Their good, their benefit, their welfare. And I'm going to broaden that, the welfare of the church. Muff wasn't saying be small just so you don't get in Tony's way. There was something more driving her when she was saying be small. What do you think was driving her? The love for her church. The church. Bingo. You get a couple pastors fighting for everyone to pat them on the back. 
you can destroy a church pretty quick. But the church is more important. So, you know, make other people, make the mission, make the, what God's called us to, uh, make that the, the focus. Yeah, you're going to have to humble yourself. You're going to have to say no to yourself some, uh, but, but be, be focused on that. So that's what he's getting at there. Uh, in verse 4, then he says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Sort of reiterates. He, anytime somebody says something twi- uh, twice, you know that there's a, a, something here you want to, to get at. What's the difference just between uh, counting others more significant and looking to others' interests? I can honestly remember, never remember a time in my life, this may sound weird coming from, I'm pretty good at ripping on myself, that I was never selfish. I, I, I was never selfish. I was always self-oriented. Those are, two, I think, two very different things. So what's it mean to look out for the interests of others? Yeah, there's, I, think, I think if there's a wrong focus on self, I think we can undercut it. I think what he's trying to do is get us to the first part that you talked about, that he's saying a real important part of being part of the, the body is trying to nurture, trying to foster, trying to equip, trying to encourage other people's ideas, other people's interests, uh, this, the bigger picture. Uh, how, how can you invest yourself in that, in the welfare of those other people, rather than constantly asking the question, what am I getting out of this? You know, when I sit down and couples are struggling, I always say, here's a quick test. If in your marriage you're struggling, ask yourself, am I asking the question, am I getting out of this what I want to get out of it? Or am I giving to it what I promised I was going to give? And, and if it's that first one, uh, am I getting out of this what I want to get out of There's a pretty good chance that self is getting in the way. I think that's true on a broader sense, uh, too. How often do we find ourselves really motivated by the interests of others, of trying to help them get to where they want to get? Frankly, and again, I'm just using it because it's so so much a part of this week, you have no idea how hard it was for me to start taking my grandson hunting. This will tell you just how selfish I am. Why Why did I have a hard time taking my grandson hunting? Yeah, I'm not allowed to take a gun. So, so I, I got to take him. He's the only one that can, can succeed. If I'm, you see what I'm saying? If I'm not, but now I find myself talking all the time is about my grandson getting a deer. Why? Well, some of it, yeah. It's like, oh, I got him a deer. I'm sure there's probably some selfishness in me that gets into it. But the joy of seeing someone else succeed, he's saying, that's what needs to happen in your church. That's what needs to happen as a body of believers, that when you see good things happening in other people's lives, when, when you see the body benefiting, when you see God doing things, maybe you personally aren't getting, so what? Get over it. There's great joy to be found in looking for the interests of others. And so I love the picture that he's painting because it is radically different than you, you watch TV at all today. I guarantee you the commercials... The shows you watch, most of them are going to show you a very different way of life than what we just looked at. This is the way that God intended us to experience joy. Lord, uh, I pray that your joy would be complete because we would realize that we've got an old nature to battle against and there's a better way to live. And I pray that we would make a decision of our minds, a transformation of our minds, that our hearts would uh, sell out and be part of it, and that we'd make a decision, well, I am not going to allow Satan to ruin Uh, God's joy in my life by living for myself. I'm going to sell out to the kingdom. I'm going to sell out to his church. I'm going to sell out to uh, uh, encouraging and looking out for the interests of others so that he might be glorified and that I might experience life as he intended. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.